An Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales Book 3, Chapter 29 Of Detraction Rash judgments lead to disquiet, contempt for others, pride and self-complacency, and a hundred other evils, amongst which slander stands prominent, the very pest of society. Oh, for a live coal from off God's altar, wherewith to touch the lips of men, that their iniquity might be taken away and their sin purged, even as the seraphim purified the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. Whoever unjustly deprives his neighbor of his good name is guilty of sin and is further bound to make reparation according to his slander. No man can enter heaven with another's goods, and of all worldly goods none is equal to a good reputation. Slander is a kind of murder, for we have three lives. The spiritual life, which consists of the grace of God, the corporal life, which is in the soul, and the civil life, which consists in reputations. Sin destroys the first, the spiritual life, death the second, the corporal life, and slander the third, the civil life. But the slanderer is guilty of a triple murder with his tongue. He destroys his own soul and that of his listener by a spiritual homicide and deprives the object of his slander of civil existence. St. Bernard says that Satan has hold both of the slanderer and of him who hearkens to slander, for he has the tongue of one and the ear of the other. David, speaking of slanderers, says they have sharpened their tongues like serpents. Aristotle says that the serpent's tongue is forked, having two points, and that such is the tongue of the slanderer, who with one stroke wounds and poisons the ear of his listener and the reputation of him whom he slanders. I beseech you, therefore, never to speak ill of anyone, either directly or indirectly. Beware of falsely imputing crimes and sins to your neighbor, of disclosing his secret faults or exaggerating those which are obvious, of interpreting good actions in a bad way, of denying the good which you know to be in anyone, or of maliciously concealing the good or lessening it. For all these things grievously offend God. Above all, falsely accusing another or denying the truth to his prejudice, which involves the double sin of falsehood and injury. The most refined and venomous slanderers are those who pretend to mean well, or craftily insinuate their poison by means of jests and banter. I really love him very much, such will say, and altogether he is a good man, but in truth he was wrong to commit that breach of trust. Or. That woman is highly virtuous. It is a pity that she once slipped. And so on. Do you not perceive the artifice? The archer draws his arrow as near to him as possible, but his object is that it should fly the farther. And while these men seem willing to retain their slanders within themselves, they really launch it only the more fiercely. Slander in the shape of a jest is worse than all, for as hemlock is not in itself a quick poison, but an antidote may easily be found, yet when taken in wine, hemlock is uncurable. So that slander 
which by itself would go in at one ear and out the other, remains in the mind of the listeners when it is dressed up in some witty or clever saying. The venom of asps is under their lips, David says. The sting of an asp is scarcely perceptible, they say, and only excites a trifling sensation. But let the system once receive the poison, and there is no longer any cure. Do not publish that such a man is a drunkard, a thief, or impure, because you have once known him guilty of such a thing. One action does not incur the name. The sun once stood still in behalf of Joshua, and another time it was darkened on account of our Savior's death. Yet no one would say that the sun was either dark or motionless. Noah and Lot were both drunk once, yet neither was a drunkard. Neither was St. Paul bloody-minded because he had once shed blood, or a blasphemer because he had once blasphemed. Before a man incurs the epithet of vice, he must be far advanced or habituated in it. Therefore, it is unfair to call a man passionate or a thief because he has on some one occasion been angry or dishonest. Even if a man has been long vicious, we run the risk of falsehood in calling him so. Simon the leper called Magdalene a sinner because she was formerly such. But he told a lie, for she was no longer a sinner, but a holy penitent, and our Savior himself undertook her defense. The proud Pharisee esteemed the publican to be a great sinner, as unjust, an adulterer, or an extortioner. But he was strangely mistaken, for at that very time, the publican was justified. Surely, if God's goodness is so great that in one instant we can obtain pardon and grace, how can we tell that he who was a sinner yesterday is the same today? Yesterday must not judge today, nor today yesterday. It is the last day which will judge all besides. Thus we can never pronounce a man to be wicked without danger of falsehood. If we must needs speak, we must say that he has been guilty of such an evil deed. At such a time he misconducted himself, or he is now doing so. But we should not condemn today because of yesterday, nor yesterday because of today, still less tomorrow. But while you give good heed to speak no evil concerning your neighbor, beware of falling, as some do, into the opposite extreme, who, seeking to avoid slander, praise vice. If you come in the way of a downright slanderer, do not defend him by calling him frank and honest-spoken. Do not miscall dangerous liberties by the name of simplicity and easiness, or call disobedience zeal, or arrogance self-respect. Do not flee from slander into flattery and indulgence of vice. But call evil evil without hesitation, and blame that which is blamable, by which means you will glorify God. I would add certain conditions. When you blame the vices of another, consider whether it is profitable to do so or useful to those who hear. 
thus to dwell upon profligacy before the young is dangerous. It is safer simply to condemn everything of the sort without details. Or, again, if you chance to be the leading person in a society when such subjects are named, and that your silence would give you the appearance of approving vice, then you should speak. If, on the contrary, you are an insignificant member of the company, do not assume the censorship. Above all, you must be exceedingly exact in what you say. Your tongue, when you speak of your neighbor, is as a knife in the surgeon's hand who is going to cut between the nerves and the tendons. Your stroke must be precise, and neither deeper nor slighter than just what is needed. And while you blame the sin, always spare the sinner as much as can be. We may speak freely of notorious and infamous sinners, but still with charity and compassion, avoiding arrogance and presumption, and not rejoicing in another's ill, which is the sure sign of an evil, abject heart. Of the enemies of God and of his church, we must needs speak openly, since in charity we are bound to give the alarm whenever the wolf is found among the sheep. Everyone thinks himself at liberty to judge and censure princes and to decry whole nations according to his inclinations. Do not indulge this failing. It is displeasing to God and may involve you in numberless disputes. When you hear ill of anyone, refute the accusation if you can in justice do so. If not, apologize for the accused on behalf of his intentions. And even if that fails, deal compassionately with him, remembering yourself and calling to the mind of others that those who are preserved from sin owe it only to the grace of God, and thus gently check the conversation, and if you can, mention something else favorable to the accused. Chapter 30 Further Counsels Concerning Conversation Let your speech be gentle, frank, sincere, clear, simple, and truthful. Avoid all duplicity, artifice, and affectation. For, although it is not expedient to tell everything which is true, it is at no time allowable to tell what is not true. Never permit yourself to tell a lie in the way of excuse or otherwise, remembering that God is a God of truth. If you accidentally say what is untrue, and it is possible at once to correct yourself by explanation or reparation, do so. A genuine excuse is far more availing and powerful than a lie although there may be occasions in which we may prudently and discreetly cover and keep back the truth, we should not do so except in matters of importance where it is necessary for the glory and service of God. Otherwise, all artifice is dangerous, for the Holy Spirit will not dwell with the double-minded. No art is as valuable as simplicity. Worldly prudence and carnal wisdom appertain to the children of this world, but the children of God go on in a straightforward course, and their heart is established and confident. Lying, duplicity, and dissimulation are the sure signs of a low, groveling mind. 
in the fourth book of his Confessions, St. Augustine had said that his soul and that of his friend made but one soul, that after his friend's death his life was abhorrent to him, since he had but half a life, and yet for the same reason he feared to die and to cause his friend to die wholly. Later in life he thought these expressions too affected and too artificial, and erased them. Remark well how susceptible this great man was to affectation in words. Unquestionably, faithful, straightforward, sincere speech is a great ornament to the life of a Christian. David says, I said, I will take heed unto my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. And set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and a door round about my lips. The royal St. Louis gave it as a counsel never to contradict any one, unless there was some harm or sin in consenting, and thus to avoid altercation and dispute. But when it is requisite to contradict someone, or give an opposing opinion, it should be done gently and skillfully, so as not to irritate our neighbors. And besides, we gain nothing by a lack of mildness. The short speech so much commended by the ancients does not so much mean that we should use few words as that we should not use many that are unprofitable. For in conversation, quality matters more than quantity. I would have you avoid extremes, for there seems to be a lack of confidence or some degree of contempt in being always restrained and strictly refusing to join in familiar conversation. While a perpetual chatter and gossip, which gives nobody else time or opportunity to speak, is trifling and vexatious. St. Louis condemned private discussion or conversation in general society, especially at mealtimes. If anyone has something good to say, he remarked, let them give all present the benefit of it, but let him be silent on private and important subjects. End of Chapter 30